All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Wake Forest Law Review's 2021 Spring Symposium on Secondary Trauma in the Legal Profession. We have a great group of speakers today, and we're really looking forward to getting started on what we feel like is a very important and timely conversation. I'd like to start by thanking all of our sponsors who have helped us with the event, uh, the Innocence Project, the ACLU of North Carolina, the Forsyth County Bar Association, the Wake Forest Program for Leadership and Character, the Wake Forest Department of Psychology, the Wake Forest School of Medicine, and the Wake Forest University's Provost Office. If you'd like to engage with some of the work of our speakers, uh, please watch out for the Wake Forest Law Review Symposium edition that's going to come out later this year. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Wake Forest Law's Dean Aiken, who will give a few words and welcome and introduce our first panel. Welcome. Obviously, this is an important issue. We have over 1,100 people signed up for it from over 30 states. And I'm really glad that we're doing this. And I, I have many people, we have many people to thank. I'm just gonna mention a couple. Ethan Haddon has, has been the person who's been putting this together with Kyle Brady, who's the editor of the Law Review. And uh, the faculty involvement is with Kenneth Townsend and Mark Rabel. Mark Rabel um, is gonna be running the first panel. I'll tell you a little bit more about him when I introduce the next panel. This is an important, discussion to, on secondary trauma and the way that it has been designed for this particular uh, webinar is to start with a real understanding of what secondary trauma is and then to close with some ideas about how we can um, deal with secondary trauma, some solutions for it. And of course, critical to this discussion is an awareness of how structural inequality can in fact have a, a disparate impact on people. So there's a section on the impact, the racial disparities in secondary trauma and the degree to which people of color, particularly black people affect, um, are affected by trauma uh, and that that has a real impact on them as lawyers. So I'm excited about this. I wish you all um, a wonderful day. I'm gonna be coming in and out because of my work, but um, I wanna start you off <clears throat> with the first panel. Um, and this is um, moderated by Mark Rabel, who is pretty much the inspiration for this. And no one else could know more about secondary trauma than a lawyer who's been doing death penalty work and exoneration work for his entire career. He is the clinic, he's a clinical professor of law and the head of our Innocence and Justice Clinic. He is well known for his work with Daryl Hunt, an amazing um, effort to have him exonerated. And his prior practice was doing civil and criminal litigation, in particular death penalty cases. So I will turn this over to him and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Dean Aiken, for being here and for introducing us. And thanks to the Law Review for um, agreeing to sponsor this very important discussion. It's something that, as Dean Aiken just mentioned, I've been very concerned about uh, because of my own experiences over the last 40 years of being a lawyer, doing death penalty work and trying to free the innocent people from the system. It's something that I personally became interested in in about 2008 as a result of a lot of death penalty work and having witnessed an execution. And things really sort of got more difficult from there because of the cumulative impact of, of everything. So we're, we're not gonna be too technical here at the beginning of this symposium on what is the definition of secondary trauma. Generally speaking, it's how those of us in the legal system are affected by what we do, what we hear, what we report, and what we see. It means not only the lawyers, but also the judges, the jurors, our partners, our spouses, our children. And so we're going to hear about we're going to hear about that now later, uh, particularly with Dr. Porterfield. You will hear a little bit more of the definitions of secondary trauma and how it relates to post-traumatic stress disorder, but suffice it to say that direct and secondary trauma end up having the same effects, not to belittle or deny, you know, certainly the people that go through the direct experiences of crime and war and things like that are, are not affected in a completely different way, but the science and the medicine are now showing us that we who 
report on it, we who witness what happened to these people are also affected. It's been particularly a difficult year, as we know, um, with this pandemic, and it has made most of us solo practitioners, no matter where we are. You know, we could be in a big firm, we could be in the military, we could be in a public defender office, a prosecutor office, but we've been isolated. And so one of the discussions this morning will be, what effect has that had on us? We know, of course, from studies recently released by the ABA and others, that it's a difficult uh, profession. We know that we have higher rates of depression, substance abuse, suicidal ideation. And some of the work can be harder than other parts of the work. So the outline for today, as Dean Aiken sort of indicated, uh, goes from the testimonials that you hear in this first panel to scientific ways of studying and documenting the impact in the second panel to the third panel, which goes into what are the ways out and what are the remedies? In other words, how can we promote resilience and hopefully try to prevent secondary traumatic effects on those of us who do the work or who are dragged into the work like, like the juror that you'll hear from. We'll hear this afternoon that race and being a marginalized person can be in many ways an exacerbator of secondary trauma, probably more of a direct experience. And I, I know personally, I learned a lot about that, paying attention to these things in the last year. So we have a whole separate panel to talk about the effects on, on particularly black people. We have judges, a prosecutor, and lawyers who will be talking about that on, on the first panel this afternoon. And then in the end, we have to make our institutions, our court systems, and our law schools aware of what's going on so that we can take leadership and train our young lawyers not to be affected uh, or how not to be too affected by it. We're going to be affected because of the work. The question is, how do we avoid the secondary traumatic impacts? So I'm going to be introducing each speaker as they, as they come up, but I can't really ask these people who are wonderful people to do, to do this without doing this myself, uh, because the three people that are going to be speaking after me are, are really pretty brave. And uh, one has really never, two actually have never spoken publicly about some of this. So it's, a, it's emotional, it's gonna be difficult, but you know, um, I really appreciate what they're doing. I have to say that you know, I found myself in a situation in 2016 when my client of 20 years and friend of 12 years uh, took his own life. And to me, this was a real existential crisis. And even though I've never been someone who felt suicidal, I would have to say that in the weeks after Daryl was found dead and it was ruled a suicide, I found myself in very strange situations, standing on a balcony at the Innocence Conference in San Antonio a few weeks after Daryl's death, looking down, wondering what that would be like to fall. That is not something I ever experienced. And I attributed directly to the work, to what had gone on. And there's other things, you know, there's always like with death penalty work, the dark cloud of the next case. With innocence work, it actually can even be more difficult uh, because the chances of extricating somebody who's been buried by the system are, you know, at best one in 500, despite a very high rate of innocent people being locked up. I'd like to uh, begin this morning with a friend of mine who passed away last year. His name is uh, Larry, Larry Hammond. Larry was uh, just a little bit older than me, but he founded a big firm. I would call it a big firm with 50, 60 lawyers in Phoenix, Arizona. And he started this firm after clerking for the United States Supreme Court. He was there when the firm and opinion came out. He worked in President Carter's administration. And then when he founded this firm, which was basically a civil litigation firm, he always pledged that his firm would have five or six or at least one death penalty case. And in practice, they always had five or six. 
So I interviewed Larry a few years before he died, and I'd like to play a couple of clips from that interview from 2015. Hope I think the sound might be a bit delayed, but we're going to give it a shot. This is something I have wondered about and worried about, but have not done a thing about for a long time. I think I may have mentioned to you that my oldest daughter is an MSW who treats abused women and children. Uh, she fully understands uh, the need for separate counseling for people in her profession. The, the other professionals who do work in her field have their own support system to provide um, mental, psychological, and, and other kinds of therapies for them. Uh, and, and so I began thinking years ago that we should be doing uh, the same thing for the teams of people who do c capital cases. But as I th thought about our, our conversation, Mark, I was more and more disappointed in myself uh, for not having ever done anything about it. But I think it's essential that we understand the, the, the effects and pressures on people to do this work at every level. Don't beat yourself up too hard. <laughs> this, this is my 35th year as well, and only in the last couple that I've started. But we'll go back to something you mentioned, the daughter of the MSW. Yes. What, tell me a little bit more about what she says about the effects on her and why you think there might be some similarities in the traumatic effects of um, Capital One era. Well, the, the, the one part of it is, is that when you work with people who have suffered trauma, and many of our clients in capital cases have, uh, when you work with someone who has suffered trauma, in order to understand what they have lived through, you need to bring that trauma to life. You need to do one of the things that they may have avoided doing, in some cases, for decades, you may be you may be inviting your client to relive horrible traumatic events that happened when they were children, things that they have put in a box and and hidden uh, from their own conscious minds for a long, long time. And so, what what are we doing? We're out there because we want to understand them, and and we want juries to be able to understand them. We are inviting them to relive the most horrible moments of their lives. Uh, well, that takes a toll not only on the client, but on the people around her or him. Uh, and and if I mean, it's so obvious to me, we all internalize the horrors that we hear from our clients. And so we wind up carrying around with us part of the trauma that they've experienced. Uh, but, but first of all, we're often not in a position to do anything about the trauma they've suffered. We're not ordinarily in the treatment and care business. We're trying to get ready for a trial. So what do we do? We, we raise to the surface the worst moments in our clients' lives. And then we say, okay, that'll be good. That'll help us uh, 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 to tell our story. And then we're done. But that trauma is carried around inside of the lawyers who care. The, and it's not, you know, it's the mitigation specialist. But I'll tell you, Mark, it is everybody in the offices that do capital work, the secretaries, the paralegals, the investigators, you get close to this stuff and you you become involved in the worst things that have ever happened in someone's life and it affects everybody. And yet we do not much about that. So I couldn't say it any better than Larry. And there is a, you know, a tendency of us capital defense lawyers to sort of have kind of a cowboy mentality that you know, we have to forge forward against all the forces to try to save the life of our particular client. And so we have to present the trauma in order to 
try to save their life by telling their mitigation story. And we understand it's hard work, but as Larry says in another section that I'm not gonna play, you know, that's why we do it because it's hard. Now, what effect does that have on our families? What effect does that have on our bodies? What effect does that have on our emotions? What effect does that have on the way we do our work? Well, I, I can tell you that it has a huge effect and I, can, and I have personally experienced that. And so I think if I had not found some practices of meditation and yoga these last 12 years, I don't, I don't know what I'd be doing. So we try to pass that on to my students so that re-traumatization of our clients and the traumatization of others in the system, including ourselves, doesn't occur. I'd like to um, move now to what I would call the, one of the concentric circles of what happens, particularly in a capital case, and introduce Robbie Greer. Robbie, if you could uh, hit your camera and our video and sound here. There we go. Um, Robbie was a guy working in Charlotte almost uh, 20 years ago, not quite. And he was called to be a juror in a terrible capital case of uh, Henry Lewis Wallace, the man charged with, I guess you'd call him a serial killer is what he was convicted of with nine homicides, rapes, sexual assaults, including the assault of a 10 month old baby as Robbie will talk about. So Robbie, thank you so much for being here. I know you have not spoken publicly about this, but um, we really appreciate it because lawyers and others in the system, judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, everybody, we need to hear what happens when people are just seemingly doing their jobs and then somebody like you comes along. So uh, I thank you for coming out of your retirement and all the volunteer you work, work you do with your church and, and speaking with us. And uh, yeah, if you, we'll, we'll give you about 10 minutes, Robbie, but we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, um, as, uh, as Mark said, I was kind of going, going along with my life when um, I got the jury summons in the mail. And um, as with, I would hope many people, I um, answered the call. Um, in fact, the morning that I was going in also was election day. And I remarked to a friend of mine in line waiting to vote that I was really doing my civic duty because I was there voting and then I was going to uh, answer the call for jury service. I had even joked to my wife that morning as I was leaving that uh, the Henry Lewis Wallace case was going on. And with my luck, that would be the one that I'd be called for, little knowing that that was indeed going to be the case. Um, went through a week of voir dire, which was, uh, you know, challenging in and of itself. But then I was seated, uh, as a matter of fact, as the last juror uh, before they started on the alternates. Henry was charged in our case with nine counts of first degree murder that had taken place over about a four year period of time. Um, I later learned after the trial was over, he had, had uh, confessed to two additional murders, but they didn't fit the pattern of the ones that we were considering. So they weren't rolled into our case. Um, fortunately, I was spared most of the really graphic photographs, but we did see some um, and they were in and of themselves graphic enough. Um, I, I shared with Mark as we talked, one of the things that I most remember, they had hours of confession tapes um, because he went into great detail about how he had murdered the young women, um, how he had sexually assaulted them, what he did with their bodies afterwards in order to uh, you know, hide the fact that he was involved and in some cases even hide the fact that they'd been murdered. Um, because the quality of the tapes were not particularly good, they actually had us wear uh, earphones so we could hear them better. And I have commented over the years to uh, the few folks that I've talked about it with 
that it felt like he was whispering in my ear telling me about this and it was it was still the most troubling part of that case i i get chills just now even telling it it um uh, that's something i'll never forget um but he did go into great detail about how it had happened we we were between the guilt innocence phase and the penalty phase this case lasted about two months that I was out of work and this was my job day in and day out. We were not sequestered as far as our living arrangements, but we did come in and park in a designated parking spot each day. The guards met us, walked us into the courtroom, walked us out to lunch, walked us back from lunch, walked us back to our cars in the evenings. Of course, we were charged to not watch TV, read the newspaper, discuss the case with our family and friends. Um, we found him guilty of all but one of the charges that he was charged with. One, one charge, the uh, uh, assault on the 10 year, uh, 10 month old baby, we found him guilty of a secondary charge in that one. But uh, nine counts of first degree murder, um, multiple counts of rape, sexual assault, um, uh, arson, um, robbery, just a, a laundry list of charges. Then we went into the penalty phase and ultimately found him uh, to be uh, sentenced to death for each of the nine capital cases. Um, I, I told Mark, I, I ended up being the foreman of the jury. And one of the things that I had to do was foreman that I was not prepared for. Because when we went th through voir dire, um, the, um, uh, the attorneys for uh, the prosecution had let us know, or let me know at least, that if we found him guilty, we would be asked to stand up in open court and you know say, yes, this is my verdict. So we were all prepared for that. What I didn't know was as foreman, um, at that point at least, because we found for the death penalty, there was a form that I had to sign, I'd print my name, sign my name and date for each of the nine death penalties that we found for. And that was a particularly chilling moment for me as well. Uh, I think partly because I didn't know it was coming. Um, I haven't talked about it, well, I haven't talked about it publicly until now. I didn't talk about it for years, even with my friends the ones that I had at the time would ask questions. And what I always felt like was they wanted graphic details that I just wasn't prepared to share. Um, up until about four years ago, when I started getting therapy, I couldn't even mention the case without tearing up. And if I tried to tell any details, I would literally start crying. The day that, that we finished, the day that we came back with the um, uh, penalty phase and were dismissed from court, I went to my wife's work, which she worked at a, a school. She was a basketball coach and they were having um, uh, practice that day. When I walked in and she looked at my face, she knew that it was over. And she and I walked back in her office and I absolutely just burst into tears. Um, and so I got through that. Then at her desk, I called my dad who I was in Charlotte. He lived in Gastonia, called my, my mother and dad to let them know that it was over and that I was through. And as soon as he and I started talking, I burst into tears again. I, I was virtually inconsolable got through that day. The next morning, this was a Wednesday. The next morning, Thursday, I got up to go to work. I'd been out of work almost two months. I got up to go to work. Before I could even get to the interstate, the, the loop there around Charlotte, I had already started crying. As I was coming down the ramp to get on the interstate, the local NPR station started carrying a story about the trial. And I started crying so hard, I couldn't drive. I had to pull over on the shoulder until I could compose myself. I got to work 
um, I walked in the office and at that point I had, um, I think about a dozen direct reports. I came in, went to my cube, you know, my booth and sat down and was, you know, you, people talk about being a zombie. I was nearly zombie-like. Um, it was it was all I could do to just walk in and sit down. One of my direct reports came and sat across the desk from me and simply said, good morning, boss. It's good to have you back. I burst into tears again. He, he was so concerned that he went and got my boss who called me back into her office and in a very loving way said, you need to go home and you need to take care of yourself and you need to not come back until you're better. And so I stayed home Thursday, Friday, of course, over the weekend, we, I didn't work on the weekends and Monday morning I went back to work. But for basically 20 years, I couldn't even talk about the case. If anybody asked, anybody that knew I'd been involved asked, I would just tell them, you know, I can't talk about it. Um, I started in therapy about four years ago. And as a result of talking with the therapist was diagnosed with PTSD associated with the case. I told Mark when I was going back to work, I knew I needed therapy. I knew there was something wrong with me, but like so many people uh, and that toxic, toxic masculinity, uh, particularly back in the nineties, um, I felt like that was saying that there's something wrong with me and I should just be able to suck it up and deal with this. And I, I wish now I had gotten help back then. I do believe if either the attorneys or the judge had said, here's a resource that you may need to contact, that would have made a difference. I would have felt a certain amount of um, that it was okay, you know, that this was not, not to be unexpected, and here's some help in dealing with it. I wish now I'd had that, that someone reach out to me in that way. I'm not positive I would have taken advantage of it, but I believe I would have, and it certainly would have made those years a lot easier. Robbie, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I would want to, I'd want to say thank you for your service on a jury, but I don't, that just sounds so trite and, you know, uh, but I think it's important for, for us to know, you know, what we're, what we're doing to people when we have these cases. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, and if you'll stay around and uh, I'd like to, uh, you, you can uh, mute and stop your video for now. We'll come back to you. And I'd like to introduce Eileen Zimmerman, if you would, uh, magically appear, Eileen. Thank you, Eileen. Um, again, moving into the concentric circles of the work, Eileen was married to a, a lawyer who was an intellectual property lawyer, a patent lawyer, as I recall, for a number of years. Uh, she went through law school with him in the sense of she was there while he went through law school and has written an amazing book uh, called uh, smacked a story of white collar ambition, addiction, and tragedy. Uh, Eileen is a journalist. She works with the New York Times and she's also now a social worker. And I've asked Eileen to speak to us because this idea, this reality of secondary trauma is not just something in criminal cases. It's not just something in trials, but it's something that affects partners, spouses, and children and Eileen could talk all day. I mean, I listened to her book all day over various hours. But Eileen, if you could just give us the, the story here of the, how lawyering and lawyers can have an impact on their wife and children. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> So in 2017, I wrote a New York Times story that many attorneys in this country read titled The Lawyer, The Addict. And subsequently, I wrote a memoir, Smacked, that Mark just mentioned. Um, last February, in fact, it came out that expanded on that story. Um, it was published last February by Random House. 
The article in the book focused on the death of my ex-husband, Peter, who was a mid-level partner at a prestigious Silicon Valley law firm that many of you may know, Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati. Peter's behavior in the 18 months before he died was bizarre and alarming, and his physical appearance changed dramatically. He stopped showing up at events for our kids, forgot to pick them up from school, had increasingly far-fetched excuses for his lateness, absences, and odd behavior. His texts and phone calls had become meandering, nonsensical soliloquies. He was always shivering, sick with a low-grade flu for months, and his skin, which harbored little cuts and scratches, took on a gray pallor. He limped. He slept all the time. In July 2015, I went to Peter's house after he had been unreachable for two days to check on him. In the days before I had been there, my children had been there with him. Peter had spent those last days of his life in bed, vomiting, in and out of consciousness. When my son, who was 16 at the time, told his father he was going to take him to the emergency room, Peter found the strength to shout at him that he would not go. My son retreated to his room, unable to fathom what was happening. Two days later, I found Peter dead on his bathroom floor, track marks all over his arms, legs, and torso. He had been taken down by a systemic infection related to intravenous drug abuse. Six months later, a landmark study of substance use and mental health, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a study of substance use and the mental health concerns of lawyers was released by the Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation and the American Bar Association, and many of you may know about that. It found that nearly 30% of lawyers suffer from depression, almost 20% from anxiety. So fast forward to 2020, an American lawyer media survey done right before the pandemic found that 31% of lawyers feel they are depressed and 64% feel they have anxiety. So both are up, not down, from the survey done in 2016. Today, according to the ABA, as many as one in five lawyers is a problem drinker, and that's twice the national rate. Over the past year, I have gotten a lot of emails from lawyers and their families talking about the stressors they encounter every day, the punishing culture of an AmLaw 200 firm, the misery of billable hours requirements, the 24 seven never off culture that technology has made possible and the inability to admit weakness, to admit to not being at the top of one's game and instead suffering in silence, which often leads to the use of a variety of drugs and alcohol. And that use doesn't just affect the attorney, but their family, their friends and colleagues. I know for myself and my children who were teenagers in 2014 and 2015, when Peter's behavior and physical appearance was deteriorating, the impact of that behavior and of his death and the way he died, it has profoundly affected all three of us. My children and I were in therapy for years to cope with the initial trauma of the loss, but even more than that, to cope with the guilt we felt for not recognizing what was happening and feeling somehow complicit in Peter's death. Especially for my children, who in hindsight realized they were literally watching their father dying a slow, painful death, it's hard to put into words the agony it caused them. I suffered survivor's guilt for many years and sometimes still do, especially when there's a milestone type celebration for one of my children. And I question why I get to be there and Peter isn't. We all did a kind of trauma-focused therapy known as EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing to help us reprocess the traumatic memories we have of the day Peter died and his alarming behavior and illness in the weeks and months leading up to his death. I suffered for months from intrusive images as I was the person who found Peter. Most people assume that Peter's physical death was the cause of most of our grief uh, that our family experienced, but the reality was that we had already lost a great deal in the years leading up to that day. My marriage, for example, never stood a chance with Peter climbing the big law ladder and he was not present for so many important events in his kids' lives and in our family life. He worked through Christmas dinner and other holidays, rarely took vacations with us, and the few times he did, worked most of the time. He missed soccer games, birthday parties, school plays, you name it. In the year before he died, my teenage son would get to his father's house only to find that Peter was gone. No food in the house. He didn't even remember it was his night with his son. After years of this, we all felt marginalized <clears throat> by Peter's job. That job we knew would always come first. I remember when my son was about eight years old, he asked me one night if Peter was ever sorry that he'd had children because it forced him to work all the time. 
but no one was forcing Peter to work the way he was. Yet he could not see a way out. Even as he lay dying, the last call he ever made was to dial into a work conference call, not to call his kids and ask for help or tell them he loved them, not even to 911. He was working, or at least he was trying to work, up until he died. I spoke to many attorneys and judges for my memoir, Smacked, and the reasons for drug and alcohol abuse were strikingly similar, relief from the intense stress and pressure of both job and life. Like Peter, most of these folks felt they were being squeezed from all sides. Peter, for example, could never work enough hours to satisfy his, firm, his firm's insatiable need for revenue. He would never have enough time to really be present and involved with his children or his wife. He had few friends other than those at the firm who were at the same time competing with him and each other to build their book of business. Brian Cuban, the brother of famous Mark Cuban of Shark Tank and the Dallas Mavericks was addicted to alcohol and cocaine when he was a practicing attorney. He told me, quote, stress from the competitive environment certainly played a factor in my desire to drink and use drugs. I was scared of losing my job, afraid of failing, afraid of walking into a courtroom. The only way I could do that, the only way to perform as a lawyer was to do coke. Will Miller, who was an attorney in Seattle prosecuting sex crimes against children, um, became a methamphetamine addict. Um, he was arrested, convicted of possession, and sent to prison and disbarred. He fought for eight years to get his license back, and he was officially reinstated in 2010. He now works in a family law firm in Washington State. Will told me that other jobs are stressful, yes, like being a surgeon, but he said, it's not stressful in the same way as being a lawyer, and I quote, that's like being a surgeon with another doctor across from you trying to undo your operation. Lawyers are hostile and that is reinforced by their clients. Now you have someone who is financially rewarded for being hostile. So it makes sense to me that people wanna go home and sedate. Your client wants to see you respond so lawyers get drawn into a lot of hostile conflict. It's hard to separate that from you as a person. Lawyers usually have the personality type INTJ, which is introverted, intuitive, thinking and judging. It is one of the least common personality types among the general population. The mindset, as described by the consultant Larry Richard of Lawyer Brain, whose work is based on more than 25,000 sets of data on lawyer personalities, is a negativity mindset. This glass half empty way of viewing the world is often essential for the practice of law as lawyers look for problems and irregularities and have to think dispassionately about them. But with that mindset comes depression and anxiety. In fact, research from psychologist Martin Seligman, who is the father of positive psychology, found that emotions like anger, jealousy, and anxiety serve a role for lawyers. They narrow the social and cognitive environment, which helps them maintain an unwavering drive to win. But he also writes, that mindset is a liability in every profession except the law. And then there is law firm culture. Research has shown that psychological predictors of well being decrease as lawyers are required to bill more hours. In that survey done right before the pandemic that I mentioned earlier, nearly 80% of the lawyers surveyed said they knew of colleagues experiencing anxiety. 73% reported that work conditions were contributing to their own issues of anxiety, depression, and substance use and other mental health problems. The majority of respondents cited four workplace issues that are negatively impacting their mental health and well being always being on call, billable hours pressure, lack of sleep and client demands. Two thirds of respondents said that work had caused their personal relationships to suffer. Respondents to the survey blasted billable hours, clients, unrealistic deadlines and unused vacations as causes of the profession's mental health crisis. Yet many respondents also professed doubt that these realities, which are, part, which are in part responsible for the profitability of modern law firms will ever be changed. I think it's especially important to recognize how severely the 24 seven workplace impacts an attorney's satisfaction with work and their mental health. Lawyers say they feel their career is at risk anytime they turn off their phone or ignore their email inbox, even on vacation. This always on mentality exacerbates an already, an already stressful profession. Many of the attorneys surveyed said that they would take a pay cut to work fewer hours and be able to disconnect. And as it is doing in nearly every sphere of our lives, the pandemic is bringing to the surface and exacerbating the problems that already exist in the legal profession. The New York City Lawyers Assistance Program, for example, recently held a discussion of substance use and mental health. 
Normally a webinar like that would attract about 100 attorneys, 700 attended. And at the end of May, the Kentucky Lawyers Assistance Program also held a webinar. Theirs was titled, Managing Your Anxiety and Well-Being While Transitioning into the New Normal, and gave attorneys the ability to ask questions anonymously. Pre-COVID, they told me about 50 lawyers would have showed up. More than 500 attended. Eileen, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, that term, negativity mindset, explains so much. Um, I know when I went to law school, first and second year were pretty hard as they taught us to quote, think like a lawyer. And I think traditionally we have done that. We're starting, we're starting to change now. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing I have started is a contemplative practices class here at Wake Forest. And one of the things that my students uniformly tell me is that rather than just simple meditation, which I teach them, that what changes the way they see the world is a, is a gratitude practice. I ask them to write down three things each day that they're grateful for, a cup of coffee, their dog, anything simple, the sun came through the clouds. And uniformly, my students tell me that this changes the way they see the world. So we need to do something about that to prevent a lot of these problems that you've helped us with, Eileen. And I highly recommend Eileen's book uh, for, for all of us. There's so much in there. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hall, if you could turn on your camera and sound now, please. I'd like to um, welcome now Lieutenant Colonel Andrea Hall, recommended to me by my former <laughs> student, uh, Brad Simon, who is uh, in, in the JAG in the Air Force for several years now. Thank you, Brad. Um, Andrea, you have, uh, well, there's so much that I could that I could say about you. Uh, you're the staff judge advocate of the Peterson Shrivener Garrison Legal Office in Colorado Springs. You've you've been in the Air Force since 2006. You've served in Iraq. Uh, so much more. But for our purposes today, I, I'd ask you to share with us your work in defending sexual abuse cases and the impact that that's had on you. And I. And I I really do appreciate you and my other speakers today sharing these very, very personal things, but I, I really believe, I think we all believe that they're, they're going to be helpful to us. So um, thank you very much for being here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I just want to start by saying that my opinions and views are those of my own and not of the United States Air Force. I should say the greatest Air Force in the universe. Um, and this is the first time I'm speaking publicly about this, so bear with me. I'll try to maintain the best composure that I can. Um, so I spent the first four years of my career in two base legal offices doing a variety of things. I prosecuted some cases, did some fiscal law, deployed, various other things. Um, after I'd been in for four years, I was selected to be a base level defense counsel. And I did that job for two years. I started off defending some low level types of cases. And then if I did some more serious cases like sexual assault or possession of child pornography, I would have a senior defense counsel working with me. And every year, all base level and senior defense counsel would get together and for training. And during one of those trainings, I remember one of my colleagues talking about how he had defended a lot of child sex abuse cases. And it got to the point where he didn't want to bathe his girls at night. He would come home and he would pour one finger of whiskey and then it was two and then it was three and then so on. Um, and he ended up getting help and he's talked to us about secondary trauma. And this was, like I said, many like 10 years ago, probably at least. But he was very candid about how he felt and what he went through. And I really applaud the Air Force for ensuring that he shared that because this was really before anybody was talking about it, to my knowledge, at least. So after my two years as a base level defense counsel, I became a senior defense counsel and I performed that duty for three years. All the cases kind of run together, but there are three that really stick out to me. The first one involved a man that was accused of sexually abusing multiple boys that he met through a big brothers, big sisters type of program. He also took photos of them and videos of them. And I remember reading discovery on the way to a hearing. Uh, I was on an airplane and I was reading the Child Protective Services records for one of the boys. And let me just 
summarized by saying that that child had a, an uphill battle to begin with before he even met my client and, and my client didn't help. And during the trial, I had to cross-examine him because in his first statements, he said that my client had only abused him a handful of times, but by trial, it was, I think, more than 20. And uh, I couldn't I could not confront that inconsistency. So I remember standing in the well of the courtroom and just thinking to myself, Andrea, don't cry. Um, and I managed to get the questions out without maintaining or without losing my composure um, and then sat down. <laughs> um, and sorry, my kids are also waking up right now. It's Colorado in the morning, so it's crazy right now. Um, but I do think it's important to also add, because um, real life is also going on while you're doing these things, that I had my first miscarriage during that trial. So the next case that really shook me involved allegations that my client sexually abused his four-year-old stepdaughter. The child went up to her grandmother and stuck her face in her grandmother's private area and said, daddy makes me suck it like a popsicle. And um, my client maintained his innocence throughout the whole trial, throughout the appeal, and probably still to this day. Um, and I did a pretrial interview of that of that girl, which is standard practice in the Air Force. And she talked to me about the popsicle story, but she also said things that didn't make sense. Like my client would sit on top of the refrigerator and poop in her mouth. So trial came um, and we started a day late because I suffered my second miscarriage. And the four-year-old took the stand and the prosecutor and I stood right in front of the, the witness stand to try to block her from seeing my client to not upset her or not distract her. And the four-year-old girl got on her knees and bobbed her head. And she talked about the popsicle, but she also, I questioned her and, and she, she did talk about the crazy stories about the pooping in the mouth. Um, it, I don't know how I managed to hold it together, um, but I did. I do remember though, when I gave my closing argument, I was thinking in my head, how can I sell this? Like, how can I explain that a four-year-old girl knows how to bob her head? Um, he was convicted and uh, he wasn't grateful to say the least for my services. He filed a claim I was ineffective. Um, he did not prevail, but it had bothered me. Uh, that night, the defense team and the prosecution team all went out for dinner and drinks. And I drank too much that evening because that was my way of dealing with it. The last case that sticks out involved another case where my client abused his stepdaughter. Uh, his wife confronted him while wearing a wire and asked if her child spit or swallowed. And he responded that she had swallowed. And I realized after he was sentenced that I just seemed hardened to all of it. And I knew that was not good. Um, so I was coming up on the end of my three years as a senior defense counsel and my marriage was not in the best state. We had stopped talking to each other about our lives and I was drinking too much. Uh, I kept thinking about the 12 year old that didn't have a very high IQ and already had a terrible upbringing and that four year old child. And I kept hoping that they would both forget about what my client had done to them. I, I didn't want to have kids anymore, uh, and I was only talking with my defense counsel friends, and we would joke about the worst things just to make light of them. I mean, the bottom line is it wasn't healthy. So because of my friends speaking years prior about not being able to bathe, bathe his children, I got help. I talked about it, and I probably honestly should go back and talk some more because it never goes away. I will never forget those children, and I have two boys now, and at first I didn't want to bathe them either. And I'm still worried how am I gonna handle them getting older and them having electronic devices and you know just the realities of the real world, how I will protect them. Um, I, want to, I just want to take a few things away from this. And one is that secondary trauma is real. Two, you should talk to somebody about it. And I would personally argue that your significant other shouldn't be the only person. Um, and third, I have absolutely no regret in defending those men for any minute. They have constitutional rights and I am proud to say that I defended them. My only regret is that I didn't seek help sooner so that I can start employing healthier habits in my life. Um, I just ask that you all do better than I did. Thank you. Andrea, thank, thank you so much. Uh, while, while you're still here, let me, let me ask you. Um, so you're gonna keep doing this work what are there changes that you can recommend to other other attorneys who work with you and handle these kinds of cases that can help prevent the suffering that you endured? I think anytime you do a child sex abuse case or even a child pornography case or a sexual assault case, just go talk to somebody. I mean, it doesn't hurt. I mean, maybe you can ward off some of the worst, of, the worst effects of it. Um, get ahead of it. <laughs> 
And I think also pay attention to your colleagues and your friends and, and be able to be honest with them if you start seeing them drinking too much or acting funny. Encourage them to go get help. Just be honest about how you're feeling. I think that that would be beneficial. In a, uh, on the third panel, we're gonna hear from Cheryl Nickham who works in the Department of Justice really on the other side of what you do. And she'll talk about the normalization of techniques that should be taken with prosecutors who work on these cases. In other words, to make it normal to regularly talk about what you're going through and maybe with somebody in the, in the office. Is that, when you said talk to somebody, did you mean talk to somebody like a therapist or somebody within your own office? I think both. <laughs> um, I do think a therapist is important though, because they can really help you with working through what you're dealing with in a professional manner. I mean, that's what they're trained to do. And they can give you healing techniques and coping mechanisms. But I mean, also talking with colleagues, I think that's really helped me as well get through this. The other uh, thing, it, it's really interesting, you know, of course, you're in the military, you've served in a war zone. And you said something a minute ago that one of the takeaways should be here that secondary trauma is real, which I, I think says a lot about where we are in the world today, you know, because for so long, a lot of people in the military and in society even denied that there was such a thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. Would, do you see progress? Oh, I do, absolutely. And I, I really do have to give the credit, credit to the Air Force for being in front of this. Like I said, we were talking about this 10 years ago. So yeah, I definitely see progress. And I see PTSD too as being more acceptable and understanding in our, in our country. Thank you so much, Andrea. If you'll, if you'll stay on and if Eileen and Robbie will come back as well. Um, Robbie, um, we had a question for you, which was, I guess this is either for you or maybe you're, you talked to your therapist about this. Do you believe that the trauma that you suffered was the result of being confronted with the horrible circumstances or the K of the case, you know, the evidence, or was it the fact that you had to sentence somebody to death? I, I think it was both. Um, I will say over the years, my mind goes back to the young women. Um, and I say young because they were all in their twenties. Uh, my mind goes back to those young women and what they endured. And honestly, to think about the last moments of their lives, Henry was somebody that they knew. And in fact, in almost, if not every case, they had worked for him at various fast food restaurants. So the last moments of their lives, they were looking into the eyes of someone they knew and trusted who was taking their life and had just sexually assaulted them. And that trauma um, I found very troubling. But I also, um, the idea that I had, and I kept telling myself there were 11 other jurors and any one of us you know, simply had to say no and he would not have been sentenced to death. So it wasn't all on me, but the fact that, that I was the foreman, that I helped shape the conversations and that, that I voted for the death penalty has been troubling as well. I will say he is still on death row. He has not yet been executed. Robbie, though, I mean, this, this symposium is not about the appropriateness of the death penalty, but with everything that you've been through, have you changed your opinion about the death penalty in and of itself? I and mean, would that, if this, if you had not had to, you know, sit and listen to this, uh, in other words, was it worth it? Ooh, um, that's, that's two different questions. Um, has my opinion changed? I would say my opinion has remained over the years in flux. I have um, talked with, the only persons that I've ever, ever talked with until I started seeking therapy were my pastors because I moved a number of years uh, or over a number of years to different cities. And I talked with various pastors about what I'd gone through. And they in, uh, frequently gave me some reading to do. And so I've done some reading on the death penalty and you know whether it's right or wrong. And I honestly don't know where I stand at this point. Um, 
but uh, I, I will say, I said then, because I had several people between voir dire and the case starting, I had about two weeks that I was back at work and I had various people say, well, you know, I would have known what to say that they wouldn't have seated me on the jury. And in every instance, I told them the same thing. I didn't volunteer to be on this jury. I wish I hadn't been assigned to this particular case. However, I don't, I couldn't ever imagine a case where I would need a trial by jury. But if I did, I would want people like me to be on the jury because I believe I'm a reasonable, rational person who listens to all the evidence and makes the correct decision. And if that's what I wanted, I had to be willing to do my part. So if I were called again under similar circumstances, I would talk candidly about what I'd been through and I would pray they wouldn't seat me again, but if they did, I would serve again. Robbie, uh, I've heard that in at least one federal case, a very difficult case, a judge actually extended jury duty so that people who had been on the jury could get counseling at the government's expense. Do you think that's a good idea or would you have taken advantage of that? I think it's a wonderful idea and I believe I would have taken advantage of it. Part of the reason that I didn't seek professional help at the time was I, I had in my mind at least that there'd be no way I could go to extended um, sessions of therapy without people at work knowing about it because you know, I'd been taken off for a couple of hours a week for whatever period of time, maybe months. And um, the stigma at that point of seeking, med you know, seeking professional help, <clears throat> excuse me, that was one of those, you know, back in the 90s where the only people that see therapists are crazy people. And I didn't want people to think that about me. I wish now I had sought help. Thank you, Robbie. Um, speaking of this so-called uh, stigma, Andrea, let me ask you this question. And somebody's raised a question about it <laughs> as well. You know, um, law students are afraid to get counseling because under certain circumstances, that has to be reported to the bar. You know, if they've had counseling or treatment for substance abuse, that's that sort of thing. And some people believe that that actually is a deterrent to people getting help. Uh, what about with the military? If somebody, say, in law school has gotten help or even help during the you know time that they're in the military in the JAG service, what what impact does that have? So I have to start just by saying that I'm not an expert in JAG recruiting, um, but I have done accessions interviews and I've interviewed people who have gone to mental health treatment and it doesn't prohibit them or bar them from coming into the military. I think there might be some diagnoses that would require waivers, but I absolutely don't think that it should be a deterrent to people um, who may want to join the military. They should still go get help. Thank you. Um, Eileen, I know you, you talked about law school and this negativity mindset we've mentioned. What, what do you think about that same question about this whole stigma? About the stigma for, I just wanna make sure, for attorneys to, for them to- Right, attorneys or law students to get help for uh, substance abuse, depression, all that, all that. You know, to be perfectly honest, from what I hear from the law firms and what I hear from lawyers is very different and law students, but I think law schools are really trying to encourage, it seems to me, trying to encourage students to get help and trying to destigmatize it. But it seems like there's also these like two systems, it's like there's a black like there's a black market and a regular market, and it seems like underneath what's going on publicly, people are still afraid to get help because it is a sign that you are not up to snuff, that you can't handle the pressure. And it's, you know, I remember this is you know Peter died now five years ago, but I remember telling him like, why don't you go see someone? And he would just laugh at me like, you don't understand anything about this profession. Like I'm not going to go get help. I don't have time, and nobody does that. And you know, and I think in the, you know, I remember doing stories as a journalist many years ago when we were in the Iraq war about PTSD and mental health issues. And even though at the time the military was trying to shift toward um, in openness to getting help and seeking help, none of the Marines I talked to, for instance, 
they were not going to seek help because there was a definite stigma in terms of their peers about admitting that they had a problem. And I know recently I'd spoken to somebody just in the last year who felt the same way. So I think there, I think that in law firms, there, I mean, the law firm managers I talked to, they do want their employees to feel better, but I'm not sure, you know, there's a lot of talking the talk. I don't know how much walking the walk there is. And so I think the stigma is still a very real thing in the legal profession and in law school. Thanks, Eileen. And I think it's interesting, and I don't want to leave this panel, although we're almost at the end here, without noting the resilience of the three of you. You know, you have each been through a lot. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hall continues to do her work. She's a great mentor to people like Brad, my former student. Eileen has written this wonderful book, and you're smiling now. You're, you're a social <laughs> worker. Um, uh, Robbie is, he's, he's a a funny person, you know, in this great sense of humor, does a lot of work with your church. I mean, we've we've overcome a lot. I mean, I I used to be a really funny person. I think I'm funny again. I mean, I, I'll save the jokes till four o'clock when this thing is over. But I, I don't want people out there to think that just because we've all been through this, that there's no resilience. Um, Eileen, just a last note, tell us what exactly are you doing now and how do you think it relates to everything that you've been through? Well, I just finished grad school a few months ago and got my license in New York. So I'm starting to um, do some work with um, at, a, at a healthcare clinic for people that have a variety of complex mental and physical um, health issues. But I think ultimately what I'd like to do is work with people that are also, I'd, I'd love to learn to do EMDR as a practitioner, which was a, a wonderful, helpful therapy for me. And um, I don't know, Andrea, if you've been through anything like that, but it was, it's a, oh, it's, it's a great, um, you basically follow a light. It has to do with bilateral movement, but it really helps your brain kind of reprocess something that feels really visceral and immediate and make it seem more like something you might've dreamed. And it's kind of a way to come to, to cope with that. So I'd like to be able to provide people that have been through secondary trauma, direct trauma, you know, some kind of help and relief the way that I've received it. So I'm hoping I can do that. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah, I've read in Vendor Coke's The Body Keeps the Score that EMDR is a great modality for treating PTSD. And so is yoga. Any, anything that Absolutely. the yeah. timing back into our bodies is the way we perceive the world. Well, um, Andrea, Eileen, Robbie, Larry, I know you're watching. Thank you all. And uh, on behalf of the 706 that are currently on this, uh, I give you a big round of applause. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.